Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the York Festival Ideas for this special evening's talk, How to Speak Whale. My name's Annie Hodgson. I'm from the University of York, and I'll be chairing the session. Uh, now I've got the housekeeper out of the way. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker for tonight. Uh, we've got Tom Mustel. He's a biologist turned filmmaker and writer, and he's specialising in stories where people and nature meet. Uh, his first book, how to Speak Whale, A Voyage into the Future of Animal Communication was published last year, 2022, and was selected as Amazon's best books of the year. And I'm halfway through and really enjoying it. So I do recommend it. So thanks ever so much for coming along tonight. And Tom, it's over to you. So thank you very much for coming along today, uh, especially if it's a really beautiful sunny day. I'm very sorry that I couldn't um, join you. Uh, my Annie, my wife, uh, is nine months pregnant and uh, her due date is uh, the day after tomorrow. And for our first daughter, uh, she gave birth two days early. So <laughs> there's a chance if I just suddenly leave, don't hold it against me, uh, I, I will return, but it might be to witness the birth of my daughter. So um, I, also my dad was a Yorkshireman and uh, from Pateley Bridge, and he would have been so happy uh, to, that I'd be giving a talk in Yorkshire. So I hope I can join you in person next year. Um, because so many of you have, have turned out um, uh, I'm, I've got a, prep, a, a, a sort of talk prepared, but I thought I'd just sort of whiz through it so we could get into questions uh, as quickly as possible, because often um, well, so much has been changing in the world of AI and uh, animal communication studies, uh, and it's just always much nicer to have um, more interaction rather than just me droning on. But anyway, I'll start by droning on. Uh, so let me uh, share my screen. Um, so the talk is called How to Speak Whale. Um, that's a humpback whale, uh, a young humpback whale uh, that I was filming in uh, Dominica. This one came over to check me out. Um, and I'm Tom Mustill, uh, and that's my uh, Twitter or Instagram. So if you're interested, you can follow me there. Uh, and I sort of post updates about animal communication and conservation. Um, this is the book in a variety of different human languages. I just find this quite interesting because it shows how many ways quite similar people at the same time can try and communicate the same thing. Um, it's in 12 languages. I'm really excited to see how the Koreans uh, and uh, the Chinese and the uh, 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 approach it. Um, so this is me. I started off as a conservation biologist. Uh, that's with an orphaned fruit bat in Mauritius called Batty. Um, uh, uh, looking after orphan fruit bats is really lovely when they're, this one we got when it was about this big and you carry them around on your shoulder on a little cloth and uh, you'd feed, well, he, he was orphaned when he was very young so we fed him milk through a candle wick um, and then little pieces of fruit and if you stroke fruit bats little cheeks they go ah, and yawn and they smell like fruit and uh, when they need to go to the loo instinctively they reorientate themselves so they're hanging this way up and they go to the loo and then they have a little shake and then they go back the other way around in case you've ever wondered um, how bats go to the loo. That's one of the things that really struck me from looking after Batty. Um, so I worked in conservation biology and uh, that's my passion and always has been since I was little. Um, and then I moved into wildlife filmmaking, uh, mainly so that I could try and be useful for conservation by telling stories of conservationists. And this is a conservationist called Rodrigo Medellin. Uh, and a film that I made called The Batman of Mexico with him and David Attenborough. Um, and that's a lesser long-nosed bat. Um, and uh, uh, this is a kangaroo called Ella in another film I made. Um, technology has always been uh, an enormously important part of uh, biology and of conservation. Um, oh, it's only uh, through technology that we have wildlife films um, and that we can transmit uh, image, like, uh, images and behaviors of other species. Uh, until we had video cameras and sound recording devices, the only way for us really to understand the lives of other species was to witness them ourselves, um, see them in captivity, um, which is a, a very sad version of their lives, uh, or to go to museums where their sort of bodies are exhibited. But because of tools like video cameras, we can share the behaviors of animals. And this is a, a kangaroo who'd been orphaned and rehabilitated by a man in Alice Springs. And most of the baby kangaroos that he uh, looked after were released into the wild. But Ella, this kangaroo, um, was too habituated. And um, so she stayed in a sort of large nature reserve. And I filmed with him for three months 
while Ella was pregnant. Um, and her pregnancy only lasted a couple of weeks, but then after she gave birth, we filmed her Joey crawling up inside her pouch. And Ella was uh, willing uh, to let us film inside her pouch. She liked carrots, and so she would, for the length of time it took to eat one carrot, allow us to open her pouch and film the developing Joey inside. This didn't work for two carrots. After one carrot, she was no longer interested, so you'd get a big kick. Um, but we designed this special camera that could look inside her pouch, and we filmed, um, uh, and this is the developing Joey. Um, and so we were able to film, I think, some of the first videos of uh, developing kangaroos inside the pouch and transmit them to millions of people who hadn't realised things that, like, um, the kangaroos have four nipples and that they each can produce different sort of cocktails of milk so that the Joey developing inside the pouch can drink outside of the pouch. Um, so th that's just one example of a technological tool that connects people to other animals. Because we can think of technology as something, and quite accurately, that um, disconnects us from nature. Um, if we're obsessed with looking at our phones or we are using tools to sort of um, destroy the natural world, but it's a double-edged sword and sometimes technology, especially with empathy, can be very powerful. Um, th uh, this is a film I made about giraffes where we were, uh, 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 filmed people using um, tools to round up giraffes and transport them on boats across the Nile uh, to re-release Rothschild's giraffes, which is a very rare kind, um, into a, a, a nature reserve in Uganda to establish a new population. And so I'd been making wildlife films for a while and then suddenly um, oh, including with people like uh, Greta Thunberg, uh, who I've had the honour of making a bunch of films for. Um, uh, and then suddenly, um, uh, oh, I, I should say also that um, in all this time, I was I sort of came at it as a scientist thinking that really um, you planned stories and that wildlife films were really sort of PowerPoint presentations with fancy cameras. Um, and it was only like after I'd been making films for a few years that I started to realise that the best stories are where things happen unexpectedly. So this is an example from a film I directed called Inside Nature's Giants uh, with an amazing biologist called Professor Joy Reidenberg, where one of the highlights of the film was an unexpected moment. It's a very, very tough, very stiff blubber. It's coming off really well though. It's really fresh, that's why. It's in really, really good shape. This is actually the fat layer underneath the blubber. This is not part of the blubber. The blubber is actually this tough material here. So there's blubber, then fat, then muscle. This is connective tissue related to the muscles. These are very strong bands that hold it in place. Now there's huge tension on this. It's about to come off. That will weigh a massive amount as it pulls off. But it's giving us access to both the thoracic cavity, the heart and the lungs underneath that, and the ribs. And at the back, the digestive system. That's gone. That's brilliant. Now we can actually get into the organs underneath. It's really exciting, but the time is marching on. It's really, really fresh. I don't smell anything. It's like, it's like walking down the butcher's aisle in the supermarket. All the meat's really fresh here. This animal, I think, is only around 24 hours dead. <laughs> Uh, so we got to wipe. Get my face to wipe down around my lips. It's funny. The most dangerous thing is if you get it in your eyes or in your mouth. And so I know enough to keep my mouth shut. But <laughs> that was uh, my uh, first big experience with a whale, and, and sadly for many people in the UK, uh, a cetacean, a whale or dolphin. Uh, often you either don't see them at all, or you find them washed up on our beaches. Uh, when they've become stranded either through natural reasons or sadly often from because they've become um, hit by boats or uh, run out of food because of fishing and things like that um, and uh, but I've always been obsessed with, with whales ever since I was a little child and first went to Wales the country and was really disappointed that there were no whales there I can still remember I think I was about four my sort of deep uh, sadness uh, but I said uh, but I sort of um, worked on that and when I was about 15 I volunteered on whale watching boats and I worked uh, uh, with whales and was lucky enough in, to make that film about sperm whales where we got to film with sperm whales which are these big deep diving whales with teeth the largest of the toothed whales possessor of the biggest brains um, that have ever lived and the loudest clicks their voices 
um, and which they use to echolocate in the deep sea. And I was able to go to the Azores and film with them. Um, but I always thought that I would just be the filmmaker, um, uh, not in the films, uh, until I went to Monterey Bay on holiday with my friend Charlotte. This is her in the pit picture. She's an accountant. Um, and we went whale watching. Um, there were loads of whales and we were on this lovely tour. And then something that had never happened there happened um, to us. And by chance, somebody filmed it. Um, and some of you might have seen this at the time. This was in 2015. Um, I'll play the video. So that's a humpback whale, um, uh, uh, which is one of the one of the larger whales. It's a baleen whale, which means it has uh, baleen plates um, instead of teeth. That's me and Charlotte afterwards, uh, being very happy to have survived that encounter, which is uh, called a breach, where a whale throws its entire body out of the water. Um, and uh, here's a frame grab from that, and you can see Charlotte at the front of the kayak as the whale bears down on us, and me at the back. Um, throwing my paddle away and trying and scuttling the, the kayak upside down. Um, it, uh, a humpback whale uh, weighs about a ton a foot, and this one was about 30 to 40 feet, so it's about 30 to 40 tons. Um, uh, the last thing I remember seeing was the whale's body blocking out the sun and thinking, oh, we're going to die now. Um, and then I remember being underwater, um, and then I remember um, just sort of being thrown around with a lot of energy um, and uh, it all being very white. I opened my eyes underwater and I saw lots of bubbles. Um, and then we were, we were sort of sucked quite far down. So I had to swim back to the surface and I got back to the surface and I was very, very relieved to see that Charlotte was there and she was okay. And neither of us could really explain how we'd survived because the last thing we'd both seen was the whale landing on us. Um, and apparently when whales breach like this, they released about I think it's the same as about sort of about 30 hand grenades worth of energy um, they calculated it um, so a tremendous force it was enough it hit it, the whale hit the front of the kayak and totally buckled the um, the plastic and if you imagine trying to like punch a rubber duck in a bath and how much force it would take to actually leave a mark in that um, and it ruptured all the hulls within it anyway but we were totally unharmed and we got back in it and some people kindly drained the kayak and then we paddled back to shore uh, and didn't think anyone would believe us. Um, and afterwards, um, I was very happy that somebody had filmed it because I thought no one would believe us. Um, and But because somebody filmed it uh, and they put it on YouTube and it went viral and it got like about six million views in a couple of days and it was on all the news shows and people even made a, a caricature of um, uh, the whale as Jeremy Corbyn leaping onto uh, George Osborne and Jer uh, <laughs> an old Prime Minister. Um, and... Uh, that was very strange, and I, I, I must confess I didn't like really being uh, in a viral video very much. Um, and uh, it was, you know, it was a pretty traumatic experience in many ways. And Charlotte fainted on the flight home from California, had to get oxygen given to her. Um, but we've since both gone out and kayaked again with whales. Um, uh, I should add that we were keeping our distance. As I, I used to work on whale watching boats, making sure people did keep their distance. So we'd always be like hammering on our kayak so the whales knew where we were and backpedaling to make sure the paddling to make sure we were as far away as we were as we could be and especially it not getting within 100 meters um but when a whale breaches you you don't see it coming um but the thing that really struck me from the whole experience was i spoke to people including joy who, the scientist who you saw in that earlier video getting a mouthful of whale guts uh, and i said why do whales breach and she said we don't know and i said but that's but it's like the coolest thing that happens in the natural world. One of the biggest animals that's ever lived. You know, a humpback whale is three times bigger than a T-Rex. Its arm is the biggest arm that's ever existed. It's forelimb. 
Um, and we have no idea why they throw themselves out of the sea. Um, uh, and she said, you, the problem is, you know, you can't just ask a whale. And I thought that was a pretty straightforward answer. Um, but then some other sort of strange things started happening. And that's what the talk today is about. It's about why you can't ask a whale or perhaps why you couldn't ask a whale and how we might be able to soon-ish ask a whale. Um, so whales, this is the cetacea, um, the family of the whales, dolphins and porpoises. It's actually, uh, scientifically, it's called an infraorder. And you can probably see like a little person there down on the bottom right hand corner. Uh, they're next to a sperm whale, the biggest toothed whale. So you've got the toothed whales on the right hand side uh, and the baleen whales on the left. So dolphins and porpoises, they're actually whales. They're small toothed whales, killer whales. Um, or another way of thinking about it is the sperm whales are just really big dolphins. Um, they're all related to each other. Um, but the evolution of baleen, which the whales on the left have, these big whiskery plates that they have inside their mouths um, as replacement for teeth, has allowed them to grow so big. Because if you can take a big gulp of seawater and then en engulf loads of fish within it, and then or krill, and then push the water out, you can eat a lot more food at once than you can if you have to bite and catch each individual prey item, as most of the dolphins and the killer whales do. Um, and in the sea, um, you can grow really big because you don't have to worry about gravity. Um, there's a size limit to terrestrial animals on land. We think they can't get really much above a certain size because otherwise the, the bones you need to support your body and the heart you need to pump blood up against gravity um, and other things like that make it very difficult to grow big. Um, uh, but uh, you might think you're quite different to a whale, but actually um, you're very similar. This is uh, a whale's uh, hand that's being cut out by a scientist called Mark Schertz of a sort of medium-sized whale that's sadly stranded. Sorry about these slightly gory images. Uh, they're all from whales that have died naturally and where scientists are trying to investigate um, what's happened to them so you can make sure that they don't get hurt again. Um, but this is a whale's hand. It's very, very similar to your hand. Um, it has similar digits held together in similar ways. Um, and uh, this is what's inside their flipper because whales are all whale. Their ancestors walked on land alongside our ancestors. They're mammals like us. They breathe air, they give birth to live young. And like us, they are, many of the species are highly social. There's about 90 odd species of cetaceans. We're still discovering new ones even now, like in the seas of Antarctica, we've recently discovered a whole, what looks like a new kind of killer whale, which is pretty wild when you think about how big they are and how much we think we know about the planet and the animals that live here, that we can still discover totally new megafauna, which means really big animal. Um, uh, they also have back legs. On that TV show that I worked on Inside Nature's Giants, we dissected um, the back end of the sperm whale and the fin whale and their, their hind limbs, the vestiges of their back legs are still inside them. And you can kind of tell the whales and dolphins used to live on land because rather than moving their bodies like fish do, like this, to swim, they move them more like horses and dogs do, like this, if they're galloping on land, like that, up and down. You can, so you can see it in their, in their motion. Um, this is the inside of a whale's brain that's being scanned. Um, this was in Mount Sinai Teaching Hospital in New York City, where uh, I went to go watch people um, scanning whale brains to try and understand how intelligent they are, or maybe a better way of putting it is how, they, uh, how different and similar their cognition is to ours, because measuring intelligence is um, it's a bit of a hiding to nothing, because intelligence is quite contingent on your environment. Um, uh, uh, like the doesn't really matter if you're good at chess if you need to catch fish, um, I guess is another way of putting it. Uh, and whales have some of the biggest brains, in fact, well, some, well, the sperm whale's the biggest brain of all time. Many of them have very large brains. Large brains is a reasonable indicator of cognition, but if you, it kind of makes sense if you've got a big brain, if you've got a big body. But there are other things that indicate that, brain, that the whales of brains do some quite deep thinking. Um, they're highly convoluted. You can see the big wrinkles um, in the uh, cortex there. And you can see that, that in these big folds, they're even more convoluted. They've got a high proportion of gray matter. Um, uh, they have lots of different thinking centers like our brains that seem to be linked together, uh, where the different bits of the cognition uh, link up to allow more complex problem solving. Um, 
And what we see those uh, the whales and dolphins using those brains for are very complicated things. They um, uh, uh, can master ersatz human communication systems. We can give them like, um, uh, we have given them tests in captivity where dolphins could learn different symbolic languages and come up with their own new terms and answer questions that are posed where the different um, symbols that they're given to understand uh, have different meanings depending on the order that they're given to them, sort of syntax. Um, they, um, they understand pointing, which is very strange because one of the only other animals that seems to understand pointing are dogs. And whales and dolphins can't turn their heads and they don't have fingers to point with. So pointing is slightly irrelevant for them, we thought. Um, but yet they can understand where the humans were pointing at things and answer questions given to them about directions of pointing, either pointing with heads or with body language. Um, when they were presented with mirrors, a scientist who I visited for the book called Diana Rees did a famous experiment where she put a mirror in front of some dolphins. There's a mirror recognition test that's used as an indication of consciousness, of self-consciousness. So if you see a mirror in front of you and you see your reflection, how do you know that if you're watching an animal do that, that, that they understand that what they're seeing is their reflection? Well, what Diana and other scientists do is they put a small mark on the animal. And if the animal sees the mark on them and they, ha they realise that it wasn't there before and they look at it or try and rub it off, that's an indication that they know it's on them. The dolphins not only did that, they examined the marks on their, on their bodies, but they also opened their mouths and waggled their tongues and did all sorts of other things in front of the mirror while giving a lot of attention. They also mated in front of the mirror uh, repeatedly. Um, and uh, as well as uh, using their brains for problem solving um, and for uh, advanced other cognitive skills uh, like self-consciousness, um, they use them for communication. And these are some of the most eloquent communicators that we know of. Um, uh, I'll just play some video here from Howard Hall. He's a wildlife filmmaker that I've worked with. These are humpback whales um, that he filmed. Um, these social animals uh, have been communicating vocally in the seas, potentially for millions and millions of years longer than we've been communicating vocally on land. Um, we believe that um, the scientists who study them call their, their societies cultures. Um, they say that um, the ways they communicate with one another vary depending on where they're born and who they're brought up by, that they use their vocal communications to teach each other how to live and act in their, ver in their different ways in different places. So that, for instance, with sperm whale cultures, even though you might have populations of sperm whales that overlap in range and look identical to us as outsiders, the whales will talk or talk in totally different ways. Um, they will have different accents and dialects and they will teach each other vocally to live in totally different ways too. Um, so that um, they might hunt or forage or defend themselves. Um, sperm whale mothers uh, crash their young, so when they're diving they look after each other. Sometimes they look after the disabled and the elderly. Um, they, uh, some species of whales, uh, killer whales for instance, seem to mourn their young and grieve. Uh, you might have seen photographs of um, some of the females carrying around the bodies of their babies when they died for weeks and weeks and changing their behaviours. Um, they are, their anatomy, that in the book I spend a lot of time with Joy looking at the vocal anatomy of whales. Um, they have some of the uh, most virtuoso voices in nature. They can make um, sounds from infrasonic sounds that are so far below human hearing that they penetrate the Earth's crust. And the blue whale's voice can travel across entire oceans over 500 miles. So we thought blue whales were quite solitary because we'd see them by themselves. But if you could hear your friends 500 miles away, maybe you wouldn't feel so solitary. Um, and uh, they can go far up into, infra uh, so uh, uh, above uh, our own uh, acoustic range, so their, their voices go much higher than we can hear. Um, they hear through their, they receive the sound through their jaws, which takes them up into their internal ears, which have, in the species that we've studied, far more nerve endings um, than the ones in our, hear ear uh, in our ears, so they can hear really well too. Um, and the bits of brain that are associated with uh, processing those sounds are giant as well. And I should have said before that some of the things about their brains are quite intriguingly different as well. The corpus callosum, the bit that separates the whale's brains in two, 
is thicker. And one of the things that is thought this helps them do is put half of their brain to sleep while the other one stays awake. Because if like, if you're a whale, you're a mammal, you have to return to the surface to breathe, you've got to swim up and down to the surface and you've got to open and close your blowhole and you've got to inhale and exhale without getting water in it. And you've got to keep an eye out for sharks and other predators that are gonna try and attack you. So um, they, they practice this called hemispheric sleep. But there are other really intriguing things about their brains. Um, because there are some parts of their brains that seem to be more uh, highly adapted than ours, and perhaps these could indicate things like differences the way they think and they think about their individual per like personages, and that um, they might uh, consider themselves to be more uh, close knit in their cultures than we do as individuals. Like, um, one strange indication from that is in very sad cases where whales beach themselves in large numbers. It's very mysterious to people who rescued them where. Uh, when where the whales are healthy, sometimes even when they're refloated, they beach themselves again. Often they're communicating a lot with each other. Perhaps it's just so difficult for those whales to think of themselves as individual in these tight knit groups that they can't bear to leave one another or can't leave one another. Um, they uh, uh, they also do lots of like quite uh, intriguing things. Like uh, dolphins are well known to. Um, uh, pass puffer fish around and intentionally intoxicate themselves. They bow ride on the front of boats. Um, orcas uh, have fashions. At the moment, you might have read about the orcas off Gibraltar that are attacking fishing boats and have taught each other how to disable and in some cases even sink fishing vessels. And they've done it to dozens and dozens of them so much the Coast Guard are having to issue warnings to small vessel owners not to, to avoid that area. Um, the killer whales that lived um, up in uh, and then in the Pacific Northwest of Canada in the 70s had a craze where they all started wearing salmon as hats. They're a matrilineal society there. So they're, they're uh, dominated by these females um, who, uh, and, and their offspring. Um, and one of these dominant females, she started wearing uh, salmon as a hat. And then um, all of the other uh, so killer whales in her pod started wearing salmon as hats too. And this craze lasted for about a few months um, they'd just be swimming around pushing these salmon on top of their heads and then they all just stopped and it's just thought this is part of the wondrous diverse nature of these complex societies in the sea we don't know why they do many of the things that they do and perhaps it's because they have very different meanings for them than we could even appreciate with our understanding of what it is uh, to live um, so um, they are um, great listeners great talkers um, and they have big, complicated brains that, that in captivity, we've shown them very uh, capable of processing lots of different language-like functions and advanced cognition. Um, and um, they, in their societies and their behaviors, they both show us that they're very, very good at surviving, uh, collaborating, using vocalizations to collaborate with each other. Um, and they have lots of really kind of unusual and intriguing behaviors. One of which is that often they're quite interested in us like when I've been filming whales in the sea, often I've had them come over to me and investigate me. And the same on boats, often if you've been whale watching, if you're on an ethical whale watching boat, you'll hang very far back and you won't approach the whales. Some whales aren't very interested in people at all. Some are scared, they will swim away and you must let them. But some of them will come over and interact with you. I've had humpback whales stick their heads out of the water and eyeball me from the water. And they've swum um, from uh, miles away sometimes to investigate the boat. Uh, I've also seen whales do some very unusual things. I've in hump, in Monterey Bay. I've seen humpback whales come and uh, protect the body of a dead grey whale calf that was being eaten by killer whales that had hunted it earlier. And these humpback whales, a totally different species from the grey whale, came from three or four miles away, and they were trumpeting and blowing air out and brandishing their arms and sweeping their tails around, keeping this big pod of killer whales. Remember, killer whales hunt humpback whales. If you look at the tails of humpback whales, like these ones, you often see rake marks, teeth marks on their tails from being hunted by killer whales. Why would humpback whales try and protect the body of a grey whale? And it turns out there's a scientist called Robert Pittman that they've done this over a hundred times with lots of different species. Other whales, they've come up and lifted the porpoises and seals and sea lions out of the water and kept them protected from being hunted by killer whales and they've also protected many of their own species from them. So they seem to have quite, um, they have an interest in other species and that's a really good uh, ingredient if you want to have an interest interspecies conversation is you've got to find someone who does a lot of talking and who, for whom talking is important for 
um, and you've got to find somebody who's interested in, in doing some talking maybe with you and whales are really interesting because they have lots of inter-specific friendships you might have seen in Blue Planet 2 there was a great story of I think it was false killer whales making friends with dolphins and they have, there are affinities between the species uh, within the cetaceans often for years and years and years um, so maybe they, they're not so bothered about whether you're the same species if they want to interact with you um, oh yes uh, here's a picture from Dan Bianchetta this is of a new uh, killer whale craze this is wearing mola molas which is a, a giant ocean sunfish this is a small one as a hat so this is a craze that's, that's also that this was a few years ago now um, so they do lots of things that we just don't understand including breaching uh, and maybe they do some of them just because they're fun um, we have a long history of interacting with cetaceans um, this is a photograph uh, from the 1920s from Australia, from a town called Eden. Um, in Australia, like in many other places in the world, the indigenous people uh, have uh, stories about the uh, uh, whales and dolphins. And in this place, like in many other places, they have existing cultural relationships with the whales and dolphins. In Australia, the uh, Yuin nation, um, in their uh, cave and rock engravings there are pictures of whales um, the warriors wear black and white outfits the Kauri warriors um, and there are I listened to recordings and interviews with Aboriginal indigenous Australians um, talking about how their grandparents would talk with dolphins and collaboratively fish with dolphins which is something that happens in Brazil still today and with the dolphins that hunt with people in Brazil today um, it's been found that the dolphins that hang out with humans not only live longer, but they also have different voices and accents than the dolphins that don't hang out with humans, um, which is intriguing. Um, so in this town, in uh, Eden, whalers came and they, uh, there was a family from Scotland, the, da uh, the Davidsons, who hired uh, indigenous Australians to work on their whaling boats. And the indigenous Australians taught them, we don't know how, um, but to team up with killer whales um, that big dorsal fin you see, dorsal fin is the fin on the back of a whale, pectoral fins, fins on the side. The dorsal fin is one of a, of a whale called Old Tom, a big male killer whale. And you can see between that and the boat where you can see the uh, harpooner stood at the front, the aboriginal harpooner, um, there is a small fin and that is of a young, uh, I think, fin whale, maybe it's a minke, um, whose mother is just ahead and they're hunting the mother. Um, and what's happening here is that the killer whales are hunting with the humans. And this happened for over four generations of the Davidsons. The killer whales didn't hunt with other whaling families. The Davidsons had green bottoms of the, of the boats and the people knew all the whales individually and it seemed like the whales knew the whalers individually too. Um, a good side story here is that as we're, ex uh, and I go into a lot more detail and background about what we know of animal communication, whales and other species in the book, but um, uh, there is the one example is there's a guy called Kon Slobochkikov who studies prairie dogs and he found that in studying prairie dogs they seem to have adjectives and ways of describing different humans who approach them in their vocal communications which for us sounded just like cheep but for the prairie dogs that packs a lot of information in um, and in those um, and what he discovered was that the prairie dogs were better at describing the differences between the individual humans than the humans were at describing the differences between prairie dogs. And I think that is a really fascinating way of thinking of the animals all around us and the conversations that we've been missing out on because we've assumed that other species don't uh, uh, communicate in complex ways for so long. And now we're finding out that they do. Um, anyway, with the whales here, what would happen is the killer whales would wait for the prey whales, the baleen whales, to be going on their big migrations up and down the coast. When the killer whale pod there found some whales to hunt, some would stick with them and other ones would swim to the shore and they would alert the whalers. They had to go really far away sometimes because the whalers camp was on an inlet and sometimes the whales would come at night and splash their tail fins and make a ruckus to get the attention of the whalers. They'd then wait for them to run out and get in their boats and they'd swim slowly leading the whalers to the prey whales. The whalers would then harpoon the prey whale and sometimes the killer whales would even grab the ropes from the harpoon in their teeth and pull them and there's a skull in the museum there that shows the, the wear and tear on the teeth from pulling on these whale, uh, these ropes um, and uh, this, this lasted for I think it was 
between 50 and 80 years. There's paintings and photographs and videos. I've watched lots of interviews with people who are part of this. Um, and uh, what would happen is at the end of the hunt, the humans would allow the killer whales to eat the dead whale and they would eat its tongue. And then the humans would take the rest of it to shore. And it's a very brutal example. And they called it the law of the tongue. But it's an example of how humans and whales have communicated in some way and interacted in, uh, for both of their benefits uh, for a long time. Now, obviously, it's very good that we don't hunt whales these days because we almost hunted them to extinction. But this is just an extraordinary story. And I thought I'd share it with you. Um, so how are our relationships with whales changing? Well, um, we firstly, we don't hunt whales today. And that's because... Um, well, in large part to a man who I was just speaking to uh, this Friday uh, past, uh, Roger Payne, who, in, who I spent a lot of time with over the last five years. Uh, in the late 1960s, he discovered that whale, humpback whales sing. Um, we were killing them by, in the hundreds of thousands at the time. Like if you were like me, like a child of the 80s, you were born near peak whaling. I thought most whales were killed in the kind of Moby Dick, Melville era, but actually um, we killed three million whales and most of them were killed in the industrialized uh, uh, times between the 1920s and the 1980s. Um, but what stopped us? Well, whales were very important. We needed their meat, we needed their oil, we used them in a variety of things. Um, and we knew that we were uh, uh, eradicating them. What stopped us from killing them was in large part Roger releasing an album of their song. Because most people thought that whales were big stupid fish. But when he discovered that humpback whales sing, and not only do they, and that in their songs are these complex notes um, and phrases and structures and repeated elements like human song with verse, chorus, verse, rhythm, rhyme, uh, that the songs change each year and there are hit factories in Australia that other whales listen to and transporting the whale song into all the oceans of the world. Uh, humpback whales sing in every sea uh, and they have been singing for probably millions of years. So there is a, an argument that their song is the most widely distributed cultural product in Earth's history. Uh, Roger gave recordings to his friend Carl Sagan, who put them on the golden discs of the Voyager space probe. So whale songs are now in outer space. Um, they're actually on the, these are the two uh, furthest human made objects from Earth. Um, um, but this, and the songs went viral. Bob Dylan played them um, at his concerts. Judy Collins sang uh, duets with them. Um, Roger, as a scientist, he got the front page of Science Journal with the discovery of whale song, but it was really the effect on our culture that had a huge impact. Sharing the, these um, beautiful songs that we could see elements of ourselves in and emotionally connect with, that was a huge part of the Save the Whales movement. And that led in, uh, eventually to a banning, or I mean a moratorium on commercial whaling. And there is still some going on today but it is no longer the greatest threat to the whales and populations are recovering, including the population in Pacific uh, coast of California where the whale jumped on me because they never used to see any humpback whales there just about 20 years ago. Um, but because uh, of the uh, uh, moratorium on commercial whaling, the whales have returned in numbers enough that one can jump out of the sea and land on a random wildlife filmmaker. Uh, and uh, so technology is a big part uh, of both the story of how we have uh, persecuted whales, but also how we have understood them, changed our perception of them, and through that changing perception, had a huge impact on their fates. Um, so uh, here are some new tools uh, that are changing uh, our relationship with whales and our understanding of them. Um, this is a drone dropping a video camera video tag onto the back of a whale. And when it does this, the camera has a little sucky um, suction pad so it sticks on and that will stay on it could be a few hours sometimes if you're lucky 10 hours and then gradually just pops off and then you go and retrieve it and I went out uh, in the writing of the book to spend a lot of time with people seeing what kinds of things the whales got up to so now you can see the lives of whales because if you want to try and speak to a whale or a dolphin you need firstly to be able to understand what their lives wild lives are like um, and uh, these video tags and other devices don't disturb the whales nearly so much as boats driving near them. Um, uh, and uh, Ari Friedlander, who's put them on hundreds of whales, um, 
they've discovered that whales swim very closely to each other and that they touch each other and that touch seems to be a big part of their communication. They found out how the whales, when they're, uh, the humpback whales, when they're hunting fish, will do this thing where they breathe out and come to the surface in spirals around the schools of fish, making nets of the bubbles from their blowholes and then communicating the whole time in concert timing the moment where all the whales in these teams will then lunge for the fish and they've noticed that different whales have different tasks and that each year the same teams of whales will migrate and then re-meet up from all over the world traveling thousands of miles to rejoin these teams and to hunt with their own roles in them communicating the whole time um, uh, this is a gps map uh, the blue dot that's moving around is blue whale uh, this is from chile um, and it shows uh, the red dots are fishing traffic. So from putting GPS transmitters on whales, we can see the effect we have on their lives as these whales try and avoid the shipping lanes or come close to them and then move away from them. Whales get hit by lots of boats, um, like roadkill in the sea, and it's always puzzled people, why can't they just swim away? From recent studies with GPS uh, and also like from watching the whales during these interactions, it seems that some of the bigger whales just cannot comprehend how fast the boats are moving. They know there's something around, but in the same way that, I don't know, in the North Yorkshire Dales, often we have these fighter jets coming in and they will practice low-lying flying and they'll be really fast and you hear them. And I don't know about you, but when I look up, I often look in the totally the wrong part of the sky because I just, my brain doesn't know how to comprehend something moving that fast and making that much noise. And the, no the, the sound wave that reaches me is coming from a different place than the, than the plane now is. And sorry, that's a really sort of mouthfully way of explaining it. But it, if you live in the sea and you're a whale, a bowhead whale can live for 200 years. That means whales alive today have lived through the age of ste a sail, steam, diesel and nuclear. Um, those are not things you can evolve a response to within one lifetime when you've never had something like that in the sea before. So it's informing conservation. Um, this, as part of the book, I went to Hawaii and spent a lot of time with people making underwater robots. And this is made by Jupiter Research. And this is a robot that, um, this video might be a bit loud. I'm not, I can't really control it very well from this end. Um, so, um, so turn the volume down when I start playing it, if it is loud. Um, it's got a solar panel on the top and and it, and it can uh, and underneath it it's got a long cable that goes down to a set of uh, kind of they're sort of ruddery looking things and they uh, they harness wave energy so it's totally it powers itself totally and it, it uh, navigates itself totally and I watched them launching these uh, these robots and they they piloted themselves under their own wave and solar power across the entire ocean from Hawaii to, to Mexico, to Baja. Um, and another one went all the way up through the Hawaiian archipelago. So these robots are, are going across like big, like whole oceans, um, navigating by themselves, powering themselves and what they have underneath are sensors, listening devices. So they're listening everywhere they go and they're recording all the time. And they recorded whales singing where they didn't even think there were whales before. And they used artificial intelligence to filter through all the recordings. This is called passive acoustic monitoring. And then, or passive acoustic is when it's in the same place and active acoustic is when it's driving around. But when you've got all of these like recordings, a big problem is how do you find information from inside them? Well, often now we can use AI uh, to find all the patterns and to identify where there's whales singing in these hundreds and thousands of hours of recordings. Um, so here it is. So this is it in very horrible seas. Uh, one thing they noticed was that um, uh, that they would see birds would come and perch on it when they looked at the videos when they came back. And the scientists, the scientists also told me that sometimes sailors would come and um, and Mooney expose themselves to the cameras, which was an unexpected scientific discovery. Um, and now you can see it from underneath and you can see the long cable coming down to the, the wave glider. That's the, 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 the hard bit there with long series of hard bits. That takes the wave energy and the hydrophone, that's the listening device. Um, if the seas were like this, you wouldn't be out there recording as a scientist. Um, and that's where robots and other tools are really changing things. Like understanding life in the sea has always been about technology from uh, like uh, Captain Commander Cousteau uh, to Sylvia Earle. Like, we need tools to go there because we can't breathe underwater. We can't really see underwater. Uh, we can't travel very fast. Uh, we get cold, you need boats, it's very expensive. 
So it's always been a technological endeavor. And here's a very new tool. This is a robotic fish, a soft robotic fish. It's not a computer game, this is real. This is from MIT, the university in the States. And this fish is swimming its way through a coral reef. And within its body are all of these um, uh, recording devices. And the idea is that using tools like this, we can disturb the inhabitants of coral reefs even less. Um, these tools are being used right now uh, and, uh, are, uh, and are one of the toolkit of a big organization uh, called Project SETI. And I'm just going to rattle through this because I want to give you time to ask me questions. Oh my God, I talked for so long. Okay, Project SETI um, is recording uh, whales of Dominica and it's the largest animal behavior recording uh, exercise in history. Um, right now, their goal is to use the kind of robots that I've just shown you um, and static re uh, recording devices to get a big enough recording data set to use AI tools, the kind of tools that are behind Google Translate, to translate the communications of the whales and speak to them. And they are doing really well. I can't tell you exactly what's happening, but it, I'll go into much more detail in the book, but it's going really well. Um, and uh, this is a word cloud of the top 10,000 words spoken in English. Uh, the big discovery in AI and language recently, if you've been following chat GPT, everybody's been quite surprised at how good AI tools are with language, is that there are hidden patterns in language that computers can uh, discover that human beings can't see. Uh, and, and this is exciting in translation. If you use Google Translate, um, Google Translate doesn't know what English is, it doesn't know what Spanish is, it doesn't know what Urdu is, but if you give Google Translate enough examples of English and Urdu and Spanish, it will make a giant cloud like this, which each dot is a different word, and the, different, the gaps between the dots are the relationships between that word and all the other words in the language. And, and what uh, uh, people at Facebook discovered, and other scientists, was that you can match the patterns between languages. And the, these hidden patterns within, between human languages allow you to translate between them without a dictionary, which is a dream if you want to understand the languages uh, or the potential languages of other species, because we don't have dictionaries. So that's what this project is trying to do, to try and crack the codes of the communications of sperm whales by getting a big enough data set that you can apply these new machine learning AI tools to. Um, that's Roger's article. Um, I'll just quickly tell you why, why I care about this, because this is a graph of the number of people in the world that have a smartphone. And you can see in 2015, when the whale jumped on me, that curve was rising very sharply. Everywhere, people have little recording devices. You have them in your pockets. You can use your phone to identify the birds in your garden by their calls using AI. You can identify the plants in your garden by their shapes using AI. We are all citizen scientists. Our, our phones can ruin our lives by addicting us to social media, but they can also help us understand the other, uh, lives of other species around us. And for me, that happened because after that whale jumped on me, because somebody filmed it on their phone, they uploaded it to a citizen science database. They used AI to identify who the whale was, where it was born, who its mother was, and I've been following its life ever since. In fact, recently they, used, they updated the app so it works in real time, and scientists in Mexico in January this year were trying it out for the first time and they identified the whale in front of them and it was the whale that jumped onto me and they put a GPS tag on its back and I spent the spring watching it migrate up and down the coast of California. They got a piece of its skin that fell off and they're going to DNA test it so I'll know if it's a boy or a girl. So I now know who the whale is, where it is, I can probably find it again and now with these, uh, these new tools that they're testing out now, perhaps I would be able to ask it why it jumped onto me. And I've got other slides, but actually I'm so appalled that I've just ranted and gone on for so long. I'm going to stop the presentation so you have a chance to ask some questions. Um, <laughs> sorry, Annie, I, 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 got, I got overexcited and carried away. Oh, I, I like an over over enthusiastic biologist, so well, that's grand. Thank you ever so much. It was fascinating. We've got some, some uh, great questions have come in. Um, I'll start with the linguistic one because you've ended on a linguistic thing. It says, as some, someone from a background in linguistics, I was wondering how about you would, sorry, how you perceive the distinction between animal communication, such as described amongst whales and human language. One property of human language is its ability to produce an infinite number of expressions. How would you consider whales to measure up in this regard? Well, we just don't know. I think that is a very important like part of our language because it allows us such flexibility and innovation. We've never really been able to understand what the base units of another species communication system or whale communication system are because we've never had a large enough data set. I would say keep your eyes peeled for a potentially big announcement on that front um, um, in this area, but I can't, I can't see anything more. Um, but I think, you know, 
I think it's very easy to get bogged down uh, with a uh, discussion of um, whether where other species communication systems class of, class as language with the classification that we have in linguistics. And there are a number of them as, as, uh, as of course, you know, but like, for instance, like Hockett's, uh, you know, the, uh, there's a big list, uh, also a good way of explaining this to a lay person. We've made big lists of all the things that make human language special. Um, and that list has is, is been subject to change over time and modification and some quite bitter arguments uh, as well. I think it rather than thinking of whether another species has a language and kind of falling short of humans at the pinnacle with this kind of moving target pinnacle and everything else trying to fall in line underneath, it might be more helpful to think of human language as being a branch of different uh, of lots of different communication systems with some really fascinating, unique and powerful properties. But um, I think it, what's often happened, and I, when I, I read a lot of linguistic papers and I'm uh, in researching this book and often linguists who, and I've looked up the other things they've studied, have never studied other species, make t like uh, big sweeping statements like humans are the only animals with language and philosophers often do this too and i found that the thing that those people making those assertions often have in common is they've never done any field biology and, and monitored them i think ultimately we've never had we've been so limited by both our own brains and evolutionary systems which have made us really good at understanding human language but perhaps not very good at spotting it in other species and we haven't had the data sets where we've been watching other animals wild communications in their fullest um, so we don't really know what, how other animals' communication systems match up to ours. And that's where SETI is really, really exciting. It, it, we might not be able to find anything that's language-like, but I think that's quite unlikely with what we've seen so far. Um, and it's more, rather than saying, oh, they're really good because they're like us and they're not because they're not. I think it's about trying to understand our place in communication in general. Um, Mm, yes. In your book, you say seem to be a lot of arguments that every time you come up with something that somebody says, oh, that's not proper language. But I'm just wondering, because recently BSL, British Sign Language, has been accepted as a language, which would not tick some of the boxes that you list as things that are deemed to be language. So I'm wondering if that's actually a helpful thing in that it's a symb symbolic language rather than a verbal language. That's such a good point. I think, and sign language has got such an interesting history because for a long time, people who could not speak, uh, who, who were called dumb, and the in insinuation was that they were mentally very different from other humans who could vocally express themselves. Um, and there's been lots of examples of um, in, was it Romanian orphanages where different children came up with their own sign languages without being taught them, which then changed and, and had new sign symbols added to them through time? Because I, I, nobody would agree that the people um, who couldn't vocally express themselves weren't people like other people. But that's the argument that Descartes had to split humans from other animals, that although he accepted um, that we that they felt and that they thought because they couldn't vocally express themselves that was the delineating thing i think the word language is almost a trap um because for linguists it means something very different from a person on the street like uh for a linguist it's about really precisely and nuancedly defining what it is and where it comes from whereas i think for many people it would be something more like if some if you knew that i could say uh, I want my baby back. I am very sad now. Tomorrow I'm going to go there. You might think, oh, that's 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 language enough for me. And Roger Payne and other biologists just avoid the whole issue by calling it whale speak. Um, uh, because I think it also is really important not to be anthropomorphic and fluffy and, and, and give credit for things that other species haven't shown no evidence of being able to do. Um, um, but often the instinct to, to to be sure either way is, I think, a bit iffy because we just don't, haven't studied them enough mm, yes we've had a couple of questions relating to the the breaching whale landing on you uh so i'll try and put them together so it said did anyone see what your whale did after the breach was it aware of its crash onto yourselves and also they're asking um did the kayak hurt the whale i mean is it dangerous to the whale as well as you and the kayak? 
Very good questions. Um, so the whale ca it came back, it, well, a whale came back immediately afterwards and came straight up to us in the water and then went underneath us. Um, uh, and so, and then later that day, it, it appeared to be breaching again when it was spotted further away. Um, and it does look in those breaching photos from later that it had a small scratch on its pec fin. Um, but then when it was seen shortly afterwards, that wasn't there anymore. And it, and it's, and it doesn't seem to have had any adverse effect from that in the many years since that it's been seen. But, um, but in midair, because somebody filmed it, scientists slowed it down and you could see it sticking its eyes out because they can stick their eyes out and it turned its body away from us in midair. And that's why we survived because it saw us and attempted to avoid hitting us. That's probably the most likely explanation whether it cared at all about us is a very different point but i think most likely it, it was just doing a big jump for whatever reason that they do big jumps and was unhappy to discover that there was something uncomfortable beneath it um, <laughs> you still want to land on that yeah uh, um there was a question about whether or not whales dolphins use uh any chemical form of communication like pheromones uh, um is, is there any evidence for that yeah i think there is in terms of um their sense of uh, the sea is not a great place for long distance, like pheromonal or, or taste, like communication. You can taste, it's very good for picking up on big plumes of stuff like like um, blood and things like that. Um, but it's not so good if, if you want to have more complex sort of trails and things. Um, I think they can sense, they can taste each other's urine and see if they're in season. I think like similar to some land mammals. I think I read that recently. That, uh, and, uh, I was actually speaking to a researcher the other day that was, that was looking at this because obviously the book is talking mostly about like vocalizations, but communication is multimodal. You know, it, I'm waving my arms around and, you know, if you were in the same room as me, you'd be picking up on loads of other cues that, that don't come across. But yeah, they, they, they do. I can't remember. I think it was taste. I think it, I don't think they've got much of, of a smell because um, essentially their their noses are these have been folded up to make their foreheads. So the blowholes you see on top is a result of their nostrils from when they were snouty land animals sort of inverting, filling with their sound producing and modifying organs like the melons. Um, and then they breathe out the top ones of those. So it's quite far away, an unhelpful place to be smelling from. But I think they do taste quite a bit, apart from the sperm whales. And I think that's because they eat such disgusting ammonia filled squids that they wouldn't really want to taste them. So I think it depends on which branch of cetaceans you are and which um, how useful it would be. It's asking whether or not to what extent, and we may not know yet, but um, different species of whales and cetaceans can understand each other. Are there some sort of commonalities in how they speak? Um, well, it's very interesting because well, we just don't really know at all. We know that they talk in very different ways in different places, and sometimes the same species speak in very different ways in the same places. Um, but they do seem to be able to interact and collaborate across the species boundaries, whether that's in the absence of understanding what each other is saying, you know, uh, inverted commas saying, and, and sort of, you know, uh, being able to team up without really knowing. But then, I mean, there's, there's some really intriguing um, anecdotal evidence. For instance, there was a, um, in the book, I, uh, I go into more detail, but essentially there was a, a, a mother uh, whale and her calf who were beaching and get got stuck i think it was in new zealand and they were they were going to die in this inlet and humans were trying to show them the way out and then a bottlenose dolphin female very different species swam in and vocalized towards them and then they turned and they followed and she guided them out of the inlet now maybe they just heard sound of dolphin and turned or maybe there was something more complex being uh, communicated there um but we don't know because we've never really ch like we've only been able to record sound in the sea for decades you know the study of animal behavior is so behind the study of animal bodies because we've never biology is the study of of comparing things and if you can't record and compare something you've only got anecdotes and we've never had large bodies of comparisons of non-human species to work with um but it's a really intriguing question I'll just end with this one. You were, you were hinting that we should keep our eyes peeled for new research. Um, and where would you recommend, apart from reading your excellent book, of course, all good bookshops, uh, where, where could they keep an eye on the, these fields so that we can see such amazing announcements as and when they come out? I think, well, there's two big organisations working, not big, but there's two main organisations that are, that are 
we'll keep you in the loop. There's a Earth Species Project, which is using lots of AI uh, to apply to lots of different animal communication systems for lots of different species. Um, that's ESP, uh, sorry, uh, ESP, Earth Species Project. And then the one I mentioned, which is Project SETI, C-E-T-I, and they've got really good social media. Um, they will be probably the best places uh, to cover what's happening with cetaceans. Um, but I mean, just follow whale experts on Twitter. Um, and there's loads of them. If you just type hashtag whale and hashtag scientist, um, you'll come across them. And there's some really brilliant ones. Um, and if you send me any follow-up questions on Twitter or Instagram, I'll answer them there too. Um, oh, and, thank you very much. And we could, we're so, I'll, I'll have a little sift through the questions we've been asked. And if there's anything, I'll, I'll, I'll drop you a line and perhaps we can share them by some means, perhaps through your Twitter handle or something. So thank you very much. So I'm, I'm sad that we've run out of time because I just want to carry on chatting all night. But uh, it's been been really, really fascinating talk. So thanks ever so much, Tom. And if you would like to purchase a copy of Tom's wonderful book, How to Speak Whale. It will be available from our partner bookseller, Fox Lane Books. Um, please, please go along. I do recommend it. It's got pictures in. I always like a book with pictures. <laughs> so, so thank you ever so much again, Tom. And thank you all for joining us this evening and enjoy the rest of the festival.